Talking about kingdom and grace. Power of grace. The power of the kingdom of God operating in grace. Working out a little bit this morning. We want to continue tonight. Operating the kingdom of God. The power of the kingdom and the power of grace. Working these things together in the life of the believer. So we are fully equipped to be most effective in the daily operations of our life and people advance the kingdom of God through us. Everything we have the right to draw from belongs to us through Jesus Christ and we have to understand and discern that we have the right to do it. But the first thing is you look in Philippians, you got, you got chapter four there? Okay, look at verse six of chapter four. We'll just teach the word tonight a little bit and see where we go. It says, notice, it says, be anxious for nothing. Be anxious for nothing. This is a command that Paul gave out to the church, gave out to the believer, because the issues of life and the struggles of life and what's going to happen can really leave us in a place of darkness, calamity, stress, distress. We do not know what's going to happen, and, and the world system tends to run us that way. But Paul wants to keep us in check, because I want to keep us on the mindset of the fact that we have the authority of God's grace, the power of His kingdom, and this is the weapon tree that we possess we need the knowledge of the Word of God, the knowledge of the kingdom of God. We have to know these things so we can stand and operate no matter what comes against us. The kingdom of God has tremendous power when it's operating in us. But we have to know how to stay in that place where God's kingdom can always operate, in that, in that vein, so to speak, where we're constantly connected with, with what God is doing, always sensitive to the leading and the listening of the Holy Spirit so that we know what is it and what is not it and what direction to take it, how to pray and how to believe as believers, being very active about the kingdom of God. In Matthew's gospel, Jesus says, seek first the kingdom and its righteousness. Pursue after the government of God for your heart. Pursue after what is in right standing with God. What, what is in the perfect heart of God? How can I be so connected through Jesus Christ to the perfect order of God that I'm walking in in the right standing that puts me at peace and understand that I'm in the right place with God. That's why you seek the kingdom and the righteousness that, that is there. Because when I'm in that place and there's no condemnation and there's no guilt, nothing that the devil can put on you because you're, you're already walking in the fact that I'm pursuing the righteousness of God. I'm clothed in Christ Jesus. I submitted my life to him. I'm walking daily under his authority, his kingdom and his government is what I'm rehearsing in my life. When I'm in that place, which is where I need to be, then that's a place of peace. Jesus said, my peace I give with you, not as the world gives, but as I have it. His peace was with the Father. Can you imagine? Jesus had the peace of heaven always on him, even in the press, even in this trial, even in those that opposed. I mean, the masses, the crowds, people shouting, screaming, demons, everything that had to be dealt with. Jesus always walked consistent in the peaceful relationship with his Father. And because he did that, he, he can know the heart of the Father always because he would say, as the Father does, so I do. As I see my Father do, I do the same thing. Stayed in connection, stayed in communion constantly with the Father so that he would always be on the right track. That's, that's, it's an example. People say we want to be like Christ. Well, you got to read how Jesus operated. See how he moved in the supernatural. See how he stood in the relationship with his Father. How he operated and walked. How his confession was. Who he is. That's to be like Christ. We got we to emulate the one who walked in authority and power. But he tells us to pursue the kingdom and its righteousness. Now here in Philippians, I want to bring us to this. Because it says that again, be anxious for nothing. That's a command. Be anxious for nothing. Confront anxiety. But in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, make your requests known to God. Every conflict in your life can be turned into a prayer instantly. Father, I thank you you've got it all worked out. Father, I thank you that you've got this thing under control. Father, I thank you you have a direction right here. Father, I thank you. I will not let this thing distress me. I know, Father, that if I give it to you, you have an answer to give back to me. I know you're in control because I'm giving it to you. It does not matter the circumstance. We give it to you, Lord. We stand in this place so that the stress and anxieties will not dominate us. This is a kingdom principle because we've got to stay focused as believers. So it says, be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving. Somebody say thanksgiving. It's rough when things aren't going well. But thanksgiving is a weapon. We use, a lot, we use the word weapons a lot because everything to the believer is a weapon. It's your battle. It's your warfare. You are fighting a, you may think you're fighting a natural thing, but you're fighting it from a supernatural platform if you choose to. 
God has got an answer here. He's got the control here if I let him. There's, there's a wisdom here. There's a revelation here. There's something he has got to say so that I can be listening to him so that I know all things are going to be good. God's got it all in control. Got it all in control. Everything he's in charge of. I was, years ago, I remember years ago, when I was working at a warehouse, I remember it was one of those unique days where, where it was just something. God began to minister to me. And, he, and I was driving my car, and he just, as I'm driving up the expressway, he just ministers to me. He's just, he's just the presence of God just fills my car. And you always think, well, that's crazy until it happens to you. See a person over there worshiping, both hands off the wheel, don't ever do it, okay? That's not of God. That's just crazy. But I'm worshiping, and I'm just, I'm just in the presence of God. All of a sudden, the presence of God just fills my car. And I'm just weeping in the presence of God. I was, I was heading up north to the, to, to the warehouse. The presence of God just filled the car. And I'm not even sure what, what's going on, but it just fills my car. The peace of God just, just covered me, and I pulled down to the ramp, and I had a lot of things I was concerned about, and, and, I'm, and I'm moving from one expressway to the other, and I'm getting on the ramp, and I'm coming around down to the next expressway, and I'm accelerating up with everybody else as we're, as we're heading up the next expressway, and I got this a station wagon, people have no idea what that is, but I got a station wagon to the left of me, and I've got a truck in front of me, and I got a semi to the right of me. So I'm kind of boxed in as we're accelerating up the expressway, and suddenly I hear this bang Real loud bang. And out of the corner of my eye, I see this huge shovel. It, it, it's come off of a work truck. It's a big, big old square spade. Come shooting across the highway. And it, it goes under the truck in front of me, right under his tires. And he kicks it out. And the thing is whirling at me this way, spinning this with the blade coming right toward my windshield. It is just, there's no, it is coming through my car. And I'm already leaning down in my seat because I can't go anywhere. I, can't, I know I can't go to the left. I've got a vehicle here. I've got a semi-truck to my right. I've already, I'm aware of my surroundings, and I'm already laying down inside my car as I'm preparing for the impact of this thing to come through my windshield. And then how I'm going to navigate after that, I have no idea. But that is what I'm doing. I'm preparing for the impact. And all of a sudden, as, I, as I'm doing that, this, this thing is spinning, it just stops. It's like right there in the air, right with me. Just right there. And then it just suddenly shoots to the right as if something hit it, and it bounces off the front of the semi, and off it, I mean, the sound was just deafening as it just bounced across the street and headed out of the way, and I, just, and I just sat there in my car realizing how God just mercifully, divinely protected me. His presence had come into my car to keep me in peace. Because I was a praying kid. I mean, I just, I was praying. It was, it was you know, we were married. We had the kid. And, but I, just, I was just a praying guy. And I just, I always had issues. And, and I just realized as I'm driving up the expressway how God has got everything in control. He knew this assault was going to happen to me. He knew this was going to happen. So he was ahead of me and protecting me and controlling me and had everything in charge. One day I'm heading up to work. And as I'm driving up, I was going to pick up this guy, and I just felt, God just said, I love you. And I'm just like, I know you love me. He just said, again, in my car, it must have been a holy car. He said, I love you. Just, he said it, I love you. I'm like, I know you love me. I love you. And I get to work that day, and I'm going about the warehouse, and all of a sudden there's a big meeting in the, in the back room, and, or in the upstairs, uh, in the upstairs room, and this is all down and say there's going to be a big layoff today. By the end of the day, a third of you will not be employed here. And I knew automatically that I was one of them. But I wasn't even afraid. And I mean, we finished up the day and I got my papers. You're, you are officially laid off. And it was odd because we had the baby and we were getting ready to move. We were going to, the, the money that we needed to move into an apartment that we had already looked to put a down payment on. We, we were getting ready to, to do this, and, and everything was like, this is just not. And I was just, so I go home. We're living with your, mother's, with your mother, living in the mother-in-law's basement. That's low. It's not a good place to be. But it's okay. Mom, I love you. With all my heart, Mom, I love you. And I go home, and I sit down, and I'm laughing. I am just laughing. 
And it wasn't funny. She says, I says, I just got laid off. And I'm like, what are you laughing for? I don't know, because God's in charge. When God steps in, he knows how to hold you because of the calamity. He knows how to hang on to you because of the calamity. And, and we were hoping for our income tax and things to come in. And I didn't have the money. And the Spirit of God again spoke to me. And he said, two weeks. Go ahead, move. Put the deposit down on the place. Because the money is coming in two weeks. And I thought, man of faith and power, I waited three. The money came in two. Everything showed up. Never skipped a beat. Just to let us know that when it comes to finance and home and family and protection, God has us covered. And when you're connected, he can minister that to you. I didn't, I didn't do anything. For me, it was, it was just faith. I was just, all I had to do was believe it. I had to receive it. Trust him. He worked it all out. I ended up getting my job back. I mean, everything turned around. And everything worked out. Supplied every need. Eventually got back at the warehouse. We never skipped the payment. We were able to move. Got up. This is what we needed. And God took care of us because we were hungry for God. We were living for God and just listening to his voice. And, and I like when God speaks. Because every time God speaks, it's because he really has something to say. Even his presence in your life speaks. It reveals eternity. Something out of eternity has just been revealed to you. That's why with thanksgiving, you can make your request known because you know, God, I know you've got this. In order to connect kingdom principle, we've got to understand and discern that God's got this. When we get into the natural, into the flesh, we're going to freak out. We're going to overreact. We're going to miss the mark. We're going to, we're going to cave in. All things are going to happen carnally. We've got to stay the fact that it really is real. This is reality. God does have control of your situation if you let him have control. He's giving you free will. You can choose to accept or reject. We chose to accept. And watch him move and protect them. Supply, it's stressful, but it didn't have to be anymore. Because I knew what God had said to my spirit. Be anxious for nothing, but everything with prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving. And I'm going to intercede. I'm going to stand my ground. I'm going to stand in the gap. I'm not going to let go, but I got what the Bible says with thanksgiving. God, I know you've got it. Make your request known to God. And the peace of God. It's often why we can't advance as believers, because we're not walking in the peace of heaven. We're... We're letting our flesh nature and our, and our own issues control and dictate the direction of our life. We can't be effective in any direction because we're always tied up. We're always knotted up. It's always tensed up. We're not walking in the trust. God's got this. Did you give it to him? That's not being super spiritual. That's being, that's being biblical. Give it to him and hold it there. It's connected to your relationship. Seek his kingdom, his government, his righteousness, his peace. God, I need this in my life. It's not that I'm going to draw from God and then run and do my own thing. There's a requirement here. I'm connected to the kingdom. I want to stay under the floor. I've given my life to Christ. That's the, that's the choice you choose to make. Jesus doesn't have your life. He's given you a free will to reject his grace. Doesn't owe it to you. He already paid for it. He bought it for you. It's there flowing. But the price is you give your life away or give it to him and let him have, let him put his life in you. You make a decision. Jesus, I want your life in me because I want your grace. I want your victory. I want your salvation. Lord, I need everything. Blessed are the poor in spirit. They're the ones that say, God, without you, I am nothing. All your talents are useless without God. All your abilities are useless without God because none of it is connected to the kingdom of God till you give it to God. Listen, God gave mankind talents and abilities. He can shoot a rocket to the stars if he wants to because God gave him that kind of a mind. But without Christ, it means nothing. Now, notice what it says. And the peace of God which, which passes all understanding will guard your heart and mind through Christ. So as a real believer, standing in God in the middle of the calamity, you know that you know that you know that you know that God is in control. And that's what holds you steadfast. Look at the next one, verse 8. Finally, brethren, whatever things are true, whatever things are noble, whatever things are just, whatever things are pure, whatever things are, are lovely, or that's of, of righteous favor, and 
those things that are of good report and virtuous, anything that carries praiseworthiness in it, meditate on these things. Here's a classic direction for the believer. Where is your mind? Where's your mind? Where is your mind? Who's in control of your thoughts? Do you have a guard on your mind? Are you letting this word of God control? Do you keep your focus where it needs to be? He says here, in order to connect with this, you've got to make a decision where your thinking is going to be. Kingdom victory is connected to kingdom thought, folks. Kingdom victory is connected to kingdom thought. Kingdom thought is connected to the mind of Christ. Kingdom victory is connected to kingdom thought. Kingdom thought is connected to the mind of Christ. When we make this decision, then I can stand in that place and be not anxious because I know that I'm interceding. I'm standing in a gap with thanksgiving. And my God got it covered. I'm clothing myself with the word. I've got kingdom thought, kingdom government, kingdom mindset, kingdom word. That's why I'm putting a demand on myself. It's something you choose to pay the price and press all the way in until you've got it. Now, stay in Philippians and and just go back and look at verse 8 of, of chapter 3. Because in this, I make a decision. I talk about grace and the kingdom of God. The reason why we have to approach grace from this manner is because people just think just grace is just floating around out there. and No matter where you're at, you just kind of got it. No, grace is what has been given. You have to step in and pursue it and draw from it. Grace is the provision of God for you to be an overcomer. It started with Calvary. By the grace of God. Calvary is connected to the grace of God. The provision for your sin was provided for at Calvary. His blood that was shed is a provision. It's part of the grace of God. All connected to God bringing you all the way through to stand holy and blameless and completing a will of his kingdom in your life. It's connected to Calvary. So grace becomes the provision. How to get into grace, how to walk in that flow is the thing that we have to teach the people of God rightly so. Grace is not an excuse for sin. That's a lie. Grace is a provision to walk in the provision so you can be an overcomer. It's part of the connected battle if you choose to. Now listen. Paul says in verse 7, on the verse 8, as a believer, he says those things, the, the old life of Paul, someone just say old life, old way of thinking, old attitudes. Paul was determined in himself. Paul had a revelation of God that he was willing to die for. There was a revelation of kingdom on him. He was paying a price. He signs and wonders and miracles. I mean, the man was stoned multiple times. People beat him half to death. But they could never beat the power of God out of him. They could never beat the revelation of God's grace out of him. And the reason why he endured it, because he knew it belonged to the lost. And when they got a hold of it, they would walk in the victory and hell would once again be defeated in multitudes of people's lives. He had a revelation of a kingdom authority that needed to be released, the provision of grace. And he was willing to pay the ultimate price because he knew it was an eternal weight of glory walking in that grace. Nothing could match. Nothing could compare to the grace of God, the provision. That's a supernatural operation. Because the believer has to walk explosively supernatural. The victory and the joy and the overcoming of God, the battlement, the warfare, who you are as a believer, walking with the strength of God. That's how you step into your battle because you've got something on the inside that's greater than everything on the outside. If you don't have that, you will never win. We talk about trying to win a generation. Without the power of God, you can't. Unless God is greater than what's going on in their life, unless the anointing of God can overthrow the things that are holding their lives, you'll never win a generation. And you have to be willing to pay the price to get the grace of God moving in your life to allow it to be released into theirs. It's a price to pay. It's an all or none thing. And Paul says here, he says, indeed, I count all things lost. Everything. Doesn't matter what it was. All things lost for the excellence of the knowledge 
of Christ Jesus, my Lord. To know him, the revelation of him, that supernatural impartation, the revelation of his power and his glory. And my gosh, I tell you, folks, people, people have all the money in the world and they're miserable. America's the suicide capital of the world. And in that is the wealthier cities and the wealthier place that carries the highest level of suicides because possessions in themselves do not bring peace and happiness. It's what's going on on the inside. And when you get that revelation and all that stress and all that pressure and all that pain is lifted off because you find out how much God loves you and how he wants to walk right with you and greater is he that can be in you than he that's in the world and his kingdom can advance and the, and the, and the authority of God in your life, there is radical breakthrough. People give up everything for that. That's the power of God because they need the victory. People cross over mountains to win, to win cities to Christ because the anointing of God is so great on their life they can think of nothing greater. They're not foolish. They're led by the power of God. Paul says, I'm willing to give up everything for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ, of whom I'm willing to suffer the loss of everything. And not only that, but I count it as rubbish. Somebody say rubbish. rubbish. There's an old saying, rubbish. You know, I used to say rubbish. That's old, yeah, rubbish. I used to just say it, yeah, rubbish. That is just, that's just rubbish, okay? That's just, okay, I'm not going to explain, but you, you got it very well. It's just rubbish. I know you do. Okay, rubbish. He says, I counted it all as nothing but rubbish that I may gain Christ. Now, this is the provision here. He says, everything else goes that I may pursue this. The grace of God is not a little bit of this and a little bit of that. It's all or none. Somebody say all or none. All or none. none. Double-minded man does not get anything from God. Because he's unstable in all his ways. A little bit, a little of this, a little of that. No. Choose believers. <clears throat> Choose believers. Choose. And he says everything. He says, so that I could be found in him, not having any of my own righteousness, which would be of the law or of self, which is a failure. Somebody say failure. failure. I don't want any of myself in me, is what he says. I want none of myself in me. So that I can be only, that, so that the only righteousness in me is through faith in what Christ did and in his righteousness, which is from God. That's the only righteousness I want, is what God has. The only, listen, when I'm clothed in the full righteousness of God, there's nothing standing in the way. I want the kingdom of God in my life. You want the grace of God in your life. Then you need the righteousness of God in his only. There's nothing you can do personally to merit heaven. You got to give it all away. You got to give all the idea, all the, all the philosophy, all the theology. I know it sounds stupid to some people. And that's the problem because theologies like that are stupid. The revelation of Christ is supernatural. It's for the inner man, not for the intellect. Your intellect needs to be reborn. You need, your mind needs to be renewed because your intellect will send you to hell. Smart all the way till you step into eternity and realize how stupid it was. Brains are from God to serve his kingdom. God gave you that mind to serve his heart. He made your mind so vast that, 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 that he gave you a mind and he created eternity in such a way that heavens that your mind could reach to the vastness. God did that. So you would reach as far as possible into the things of God. And grace is the provision of heaven that I can accomplish all of these things. He says, notice, I, I want this righteousness, verse 10, that I may know him in the power of his resurrection. I want to know the fellowship of his sufferings. I want to be able to be conformed in every fashion to his death so I could obtain to resurrection life. I want to be dead to everything that was said. Listen, this is important. The kingdom of God and the grace of God is connected to a lifestyle that's void of self. It's hard for us as believers because we are in the me only. We are in the, we are in the me, what is it, me too? Or not, not even me too, it's just me. This is the me dimension in the world. Everything is about me. Everything is about myself. What I can get, what I want, what I want to do. Christianity has been bought into the exact same thing. What can I get? What do I want? How much can God give me? What can God lay at me? I'll serve God only if I get this. What do you got for me, preacher? I need this and this and that. Well, what does God get? Well, I, I believe Jesus. Oh, okay, you know, wow, you know, wow. Let's just shake the heavens with that. It's a selfless thing. The grace of God comes like Paul said. Paul is like, look, this is the price. And I, know what's the, and I know what's the price, because here's what he says. 
I want to get, get rid of everything of myself so I could obtain Christ and everything that he is. Verse 12, not that I've already obtained any. I've already obtained it all, or I'm already perfected, so there's no arrogance there. He says, but I do press on toward the mark. I do desire to lay hold of, which, of that for which Christ has laid hold of me. Brother, I do not count myself to have apprehended, but one thing I do. I forget those things which are behind me, and I reach forward to the prize which is ahead. I press toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Just read it. This is Paul's heart. He's writing it down, led by the Spirit of God. Therefore, let us as many as are mature have this mindset. He's not saying, well, this is just for me. You do what you want. He said, this is the mindset. So I can stand in the victory and in the grace of God. I want you to go over to Hebrews real quick. Then we'll, then we'll close this up tonight. Then we'll close this up tonight. Go to Hebrews. Look at, go over to chapter 4. Chapter 4 of Hebrews. Grace of God, power of God, the kingdom of God, who we are in Christ, where we stand, how do we work his victory as believers? What are we going to do? He says, verse 11, talking about the rest of God. Now, all this is because without a foundation of these things, you'll never know the power of the grace of God in your life. We'll talk it, speak about it, live our lives carnally because we think we have it, and never press toward it because there's a price for it. And Paul said the price is everything. Everything that I had, it goes. My whole mindset, everything is gone. I want Christ and him crucified. That's all I want to know. I want to know him completely in my life. That's where I start because that's where I get a connection with the revelation knowledge of God. That's where I get the intimate fellowship with him. The more dead you are to self and alive to God, the clearer you hear his voice. Because he can speak through that. Speaks heavenly from the spirit to spirit. He wants you to know his heart. And we have to, we have to strive for that. He says, verse 11, let us be diligent to enter into the rest of God. The peace, the, the provision of God, that, that, that conclusion of grace. Or the beginning of grace, which is Calvary. Let's enter into the finished work. Somebody say finished work. Enter into the finished work. Think about it. What was the last time we just talked about the word? Talked about the power and the grace of God. Standing as a believer. I mean, walking in the finished work of God. Hallelujah. He says, enter, do, be, be diligent. Be diligent to enter into the rest of God, lest anyone fall according to the same example of their, of their own disobedience. And he's talking about the children of Israel who kept looking back to Egypt. Here, God's got everything for them here. I know it's a desert right now, but you do have the pillar of cloud. You got the fire to, to, to keep you warm and the pillar of cloud to, to keep you cool. You got, you got manna coming. You got manna coming all the time. Your, your clothes do not wear out. Nobody's getting sick. No armies are attacking you. No scorpions get near you. God's got you completely covered because he's not going to leave you here. That's his goal. I don't want to leave you here. I want to bring you all the way through, but your mindset has to be where we're going. Not where you've been. I don't want to hear about 30 years ago how bad someone treated you. They beat Jesus and they crucified him. You need to deal with it and get over it. Someone didn't treat you right. And walk in forgiveness because you're hindering the very grace of God in your life. You need to focus on where you're going, not where you've been. The goal is to be so transformed that people don't remember who you used to be. And you don't remember who you used to be. He says, be diligent. Verse 12, because the word of God that's been given is sharper than any two-edged sword. It'll cut away all the flesh and nature. That's exactly what this says in a nutshell. Cut away all the flesh and nature, all the things that are standing in the way. The word of God is sharper than any two-edged sword, dividing asunder, piercing even to the division of soul and spirit, of the joint samaritan. It's the discerner of thoughts and intents of the heart. The word of God comes in to cut away and convict so you can let go of everything you need. Come on, folks. The Bible says that Jesus... Is, is the vine and we're the branch and the father is the husbandman, the one that prunes away everything that is holding back our growth. So the grace of God can have tremendous provision and the kingdom of God can walk in government in my life. It's a constant walking of dying to self. He says, verse 14, seeing then that we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, 
Jesus, the Son of God, you have a priesthood in him. He's ever making intercession for you. His eyes are like fire. Feet as pillars of brass. Hair like the white of wool. The ancient of days. In all of his victory, he's glorified with all authority as the high priest over the whole household of faith. The priest of your confession. High priest who's been touched with the feelings of your infirmities. He, be, he walked in flesh and understands the trials. And now seated in power, he's ever interceding and releasing all of glory to you, the grace of God, so you can be an overcomer. Everything he's doing is for you and for me. The power of the grace of God. Seeing we have such a high priest, let us hold fast our confession. My God will supply all my needs. The grace of God is without measure in my life. I'm seated in the heavenly places. I'm adopted as a child of God. His righteousness belongs to me. His blood has washed my sins. I'm a new creation in him. His kingdom is working in me. My gosh, I have an ever-living priest with his kingdom moving toward my life. All of heaven is at his disposal for my life. Wow. All of heaven... And what we don't know is what destroys us. And what we don't pursue is our own ignorance. Therefore, we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but was in all points tempted as we are, yet he overcame. And what he does is he gives you the grace to overcome as he did. He gives you the grace, the provision to step up and win, the grace and the provision to walk away from it, the grace and the provision to be transformed. He gives you the grace and the provision to go through that wilderness. He gives you the grace and the provision because his kingdom is operating, but you're choosing. I want his grace and his provision because I want to know him. As Paul said, he knew him. I want the revelation of the excellence of the knowledge of God. I want his kingdom and his grace. I want his provision. I want his presence. I want his love. I want to know him. That's how we're supposed to be. Every believer desperately hungry for God. Therefore, let us come boldly to the throne of grace. I can come boldly when I know him. I can come boldly when I'm connected to him. I can come with confidence because I'm walking in the relationship. All old things have passed away. I, I've forsaken everything that doesn't belong to me. I call it all but rubbish. I want the knowledge of God. I want to be in this place so I can come into his presence when I need it and I can trust every need is met. He's got me all the way. I want his vision. I want his heart. I want his calling. I want his election. I want his purpose. I want to serve him with everything that I am. He served me with his life. I want to serve him all the way to eternity. He served me with his life. I will serve him into eternity. He will never leave me. He'll never forsake me. He'll never embarrass me. He'll never humiliate me. He'll never, for, he'll never drop me. And let's come boldly to the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Stand your feet in the house.